is we're going to take the book of Acts, and we're trying to finish it this summer, and we're taking the entire, uh, if I ever quit crying, okay, if I take the entire chapter 15, and we can do it in a half an hour. And I believe so, because miracles happen all the time, all right? <laughs> and, uh, and so here's where we begin, and it begins, in the, this is the first great debate in the early church. You see, you've come along in the book of Acts and you saw how the Holy Spirit came upon Peter and there's 3,000 saved and they're preaching and they're spreading throughout the world and man, the gospel spread it. And in a few years, in 12 years time, it says that the, in the early writings that there's some around 50,000 believers in Jerusalem. Can you imagine the size of the church in Jerusalem and spreading out beyond there for hundreds of miles? Everything's cool. Everything's wonderful, right? There are no problems at all, right? And you hit chapter 15. Paul has gone out on a missionary journey, and he has preached the gospel and everything. And it tells us that uh, there, was, there was in the 14th chapter, in the last few verses, and if you pick up on verse 22... And it says, you know, that Paul had been out there and strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith and saying that through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. And when they had appointed elders for them in every church with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord to whom they believed. And skip down verse 26. And from there they sailed to Antioch where they had uh, been commended to the grace of God for the work and they had fulfilled. And when they arrived, they gathered the church together and declared all that God had done with them and how he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. Now that's the preface and begins for where we're going to chapter 15. And then what suddenly comes is the emergence of false Christianity. Verse 1 Chapter 15, but, right there, but, <laughs> okay, everything's going cool, everything's going fine, but, and it says, but some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Now, isn't it interesting how false Christianity and false teachings creep into a church and is growing and then growing so dynamically and then suddenly somebody comes along and says, oh, 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 I don't think this is all quite correct and puts this but in there. And I've, I've studied this passage. It's really interesting. You see, good things are followed by opposition. It often is so true. I've seen it. I was thinking about that this morning. We're talking about, you know, and, 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 and it wasn't too many years ago. Jean, uh, I know, was part of the first part, and we met in our house, and my wife and I and Jean, uh, and I'm looking around. I'm not sure who else, anybody else has left, you know. They are, they are. And, and, and it's all joy and wonderful, you know, for a while. And if it doesn't go well enough and smooth enough and long enough, you know, and then somebody says, well, you know, I think this and I think that. And, and you lose some and things happen. And, but through the grace of God, here we are a number of years later. And I thank God. And we've, we've had some of those boots, <laughs> you know. And, and people get unhappy for one reason or another. And that's what happened here. There are some saying, I, I just don't like the way things are going. I don't like that. What don't you like? Well, well there's too many in the church now. <laughs> I've heard that before. I remember that being pastor of a larger church, you know. And Well, there, I, can, I just don't want to go to this church because there's too many people, you know. And then you have a small church and you say, well, you know, it's too small of a church, you know. And it, 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 you never make them happy, it seems like. And it's just, you know, false Christianity comes in any way that it can. And, and opposition and problems always come. And they happen in your life all the time. You ever notice? You get an extra 500 bucks and what happens to it? Something comes up and breaks, right? <laughs> yeah, you know, everything, you know, everything seems like life just goes in that kind of circle. You know, a spiritual victory at Jericho 
was followed by the defeat at Ai. You know, and, and you see that so often in your life is that you'll have a victory. Elijah, who ha had that great triumphant battle at, at Mount Carmel against the prophets of Baal, is followed by a great defeat, and he's running for his life from a lady called Jezebel, hiding in the wilderness, running for three days. I can't run for three minutes. I mean, he ran for three days, you know. I can't believe you know, how that does work, but it does happen. But, and counterfeit Christianity was introduced 2,000 years ago, and it's been alive ever since. In 2 Timothy 3, 4, it says, having the appearance of godliness, but denying its power. You see, these guys didn't come in, you know, with anything crazy. They were saying, oh, I don't think we're observing everything in the scriptures. Because Moses, you know, in the Old Testament, they, they commanded there needed to be circumcision. And, and these Gentiles haven't been circumcised. Well, what do we do with that when we're thinking about that? You know, going, and Paul, you know, had some words for some of these false guys that came along. See, there was one other example of in chapter 13 where there's a guy named Bar-Jesus in chapter 13. He had a real name of El Elimus, and he came along, and he, he had words of leading them astray, seeking to take them from the faith, it says. And Paul was very frank with them, and he said very simply, he says, <laughs> you're the son of the devil. You're bringing in unrighteousness. You can't do that. You are making crooked the straight path to the Lord. And that's what usually happens when false Christianity comes in. It starts making things crooked. And so going straight to Jesus, you got to go through some hoops first. And that's not the way it was designed. Anything that diverts the path to God except straight to Jesus is false Christianity. True? Yeah. That's where it's at. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Did he add anything else? Do you need to add anything else? No. And don't take away anything either. That's what's so important about that. So here's, here's what happens, you see. Uh, these guys said, unless you, unless you do this, you can't be saved. Unless you've been circumcised, you can't be saved. Legalism started right there. It's been going on ever since. And there was another instance of some legalism that came in. In, in Corinthians, the, the whole book there, when you fight, start reading chapter 1 right off the bat, is that they started a, a, an issue of baptism. And 1 Corinthians 1, 13 through 16, you had to be baptized by a certain apostle. Well, I was, I was baptized by Peter. <laughs> Your salvation is good. You were baptized by some guy, Joker's name. I don't know what it was, you know. And those are, oh, I was baptized by Apollos. And Paul says, I thank God that I didn't baptize any of you except three people. Isn't that interesting? Only three. And he names them. And he, he names the three that he had baptized, and he gives it to them. And... Uh, there's other little issues like that would come along. And Paul said, for Christ did not send me to baptize, but to pre preach the gospel, lest the cross be emptied of its power. And then he goes on to continue and starts dealing with immorality and uh, worshiping, uh, you know, of, of, of idol things when we put anything in place of God, and all these other things that they started adding and taking away from the true gospel, Jesus Christ alone. And so that became an issue. 
And the issue is very simple, had to be dealt with. You see, why is there so many issues like this? Why does this come? Because Satan always wants us to get off the eye and get our eyes off of, uh, of the goal, and that is, is Christ alone. We got to add something. We got to do something. We've got to, you know, we, we've got to do more. This just can't be that simple. We've got to make it more difficult than it really is. And so we counterfeit Christianity. Now, do you know how to know what the real, uh, real Christianity and, and, and what a fake is? Do you not know how to know anything that is? And the second point that I have is, is basically is this, is, is how do you know what true Christianity is? Counterfeit is a big business. I understand according to, I've read the internet, if you trust the internet, uh, $250 billion a year is the business of counterfeits in purses, Shoes, electronics, toys, sunglasses, and pharmaceuticals. Those alone. Now there's a bunch of whole others, but those are the big, big six. And amazing, 250 billion. See, the problem is you and I can't think in a billion because you and I don't even know what a million is. All right, uh, we none of us have a million, and so to think beyond one million is really kind of hard. To think of a thousand millions to get a billion and. Uh, yeah, that's, wow, $250 billion in counterfeits. Counterfeits are everywhere. I remember going in Korea and preaching over in Korea, and you go out in the streets and uh, in the markets, and uh, you get these jackets that look like, you know, starter jackets. And uh, they're identical and everything, and all you have to do is they say, ah, oh, yes, oh, this is a starter jacket. We sell you label, you sew it on. <laughs> uh, you want a Nike? We get a Nike label. You want a this label or whatever label. And yeah, and they pull out of their drawer, you know, here's a little starter label. Done just like the one that you, you know, and you sew it onto that jacket and you've got it. You see, then they're not selling you a counterfeit and they're all legal. They sold you a jacket that looks like a starter jacket exactly and you sell you a label and you put the label on. Isn't that amazing? A, you know, a neat little thing. I remember going to New York, you know, and you go down to New York, and you know, a guy flashes his coat open. Now, no, don't think anything weird. He flashes on. He's got a whole list of you know, watches, you know. <laughs> I've got a Rolex. You want a Rolex? <laughs> I can get you one cheap, you know. And it's amazing. Counterfeit is huge. Then why would you think anything less that there's counterfeit Christianity that comes along? So in the church, you know, see, one church says, well, you've got to, you've got to do certain things. You've got to act a certain way and be a certain way. You've got to dress just right. You can't have no shorts on. Ladies, you've got to have long hair. And don't you have the, no makeup on? All right. And, and you, you have to have a baptism. You have to be baptized and you have to be a member of this church and this denomination and you have to give. In fact, in, in some churches, we want to see your, uh, your 1040 to make sure we know how much you are giving to make sure there's a... You know, that, that's real. That really happens. And they start adding all these little things, you know. And so it's Jesus, what? Plus something. And that's what counterfeits. So the church got involved in a lot of things through the years. And that's where in the dark ages, the Christianity got into, you know, well, you can sell forgiveness of sins. For so much money, you can go out, Gene, and commit about 10 or 20 sins for, you know, 100 bucks. Yeah, pretty good deal. <laughs> Let's stick it in. And we'll go out Saturday night and live it high. And they did that. And they lost sight of Christ alone. They lose sight of the reality of it. So Peter has some counsel for them on this issue. And it says in verse 2, I've gotten far, have I? Okay. It says, And after Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them. Yeah, this became huge. This one is, you see, for you and I today, you know, this uh, circumcision, no big deal, you know. But you see, there, were, there are big deals today, other issues. But they made a big deal about this. And so they sent them on their way, and they sent them on, and they went to Jerusalem. 
And this is when the first great debate of the early church was going to be settled and they had a council meet in Jerusalem to decide what is true Christianity? How are we truly saved? What is it that it takes to be saved? What is the essence of it? What's the bottom line to be saved? You see, we, we, we often, we're, we're judgmental and we say, well, you know, the way they dress and the way they act and, you know, this way and that way. And we, we start adding, well, you know, the music in that church is just, you know, way too loud or it's way too modern, or, you know. I mean, I'm, uh, I'm for those old hymns. I love old hymns, too. I want hymns. I, I think that's the only way. That's the way it was with Paul the Apostle and the way it should be today, you know. King James only. He used it. I can use it, too, you know. <laughs> I mean, we really, and there's people that really kind of think that way. And it's sad. But hymns are not scripture. Hymns are expression of what God has given. I thank God for Chris Tomlin and, and those that have come up with these beautiful songs that we heard this morning. They're wonderful. In, in my day, back in the 70s, you know, you know, Bill Gaither. Man, he came along and he caused more of a ruckus and, you know, in Christianity than anybody else. He had these modern praise songs. Oh, my word. It was, it was terrible. And then the next thing you know, somebody in the church wanted to get a guitar and get up there and strum along with the piano. Oh, have we gone to hell straight? Let me tell you, in my church, that actually happened. I got nailed and about what fired. Gene, testify, amen. He was there. He was the one trying to fire me, but... <laughs> And then we had for offertory, we had a man get up and play a trombone. Can you imagine in the house of God a trombone being played? <gasps> we had heart attacks happening everywhere. Had people leaving the church because of a trombone. Amazing. See, that's how we get, we get crazy. And we get our eyes off of Christ alone. You can praise God with a trombone. You can tra praise God with drums. I love our music. I love our band. I love it. We have, we have you know, we have, uh, what's your name? <laughs> Carrie. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Woo. yeah Carrie. <laughs> we have, yeah. Woo. What a senior moments. They do come. <laughs> Carrie and the girls will sing, and it's wonderful to hear. And to hear Jesse and, and Michael, or, you know, a combination of our music. I, I praise God for it because it all lifts up Jesus. It lifts Jesus up. That's the point. That's where we find true Christianity lifts Christ alone. He is the center of everything we believe. So Peter gives some counsel. And his counsel is found in verse 7. See, we come a long, long ways now. <laughs> Hang on there. Verse 7, after there had been much debate. Oh, they debated about the trombones and trumpets and guitars and everything else, all right? And drums. Oh, my, can't have a drum. Brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. <laughs> Yeah, no way. Gentiles are allowed to believe? They're allowed to hear and believe? That's you and me, friend. Yeah. And Peter had learned that back in chapter 10, for sure, with Cornelius and the vision that God gave. He had learned this once and for all. Gentiles are to hear and believe. And so he says here, this is very important. And he goes on. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. You mean the Holy, same Holy Spirit they get? You mean that guy that, you know, they haven't been Christian very long, and I don't think they're living the way they should, you know. I mean, they got the same Holy Spirit I got. I think I got a better Holy Spirit than they got. They got a cheap one. No. No. 
They may be younger and they may not be as mature. Maybe they haven't learned some things, you know. Oh, but, but you don't know what I know about them. I know what they've done, you know. Isn't it amazing how we go? Yeah. Oh, brother, it's the same Holy Spirit. It's the same one Holy Spirit. There is only one. He comes into all of us. God chose the Gentiles to hear and believe, and God knows the heart. So number one, don't you go judging. Let God do the judging. Okay? Somebody doesn't act or behave or whatever. Hey, we're, we're, we're to be messengers. We're to be out feeding the f flock, not try to judge the cr a flock. Okay? We just feed the flock. Just keep feeding them. Just keep feeding them. Just give them the word. Just give them the word. Just teach them the word. Just give them the word. The word. The word. The word. And they'll grow if they'll eat. <laughs> you know? And they get a feeding on it and they'll mature. And they'll become the leaders. And so he goes on there and he says in and, and, and verse 8, And God knows the heart and bore witness with them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them. Jew and Gentile are the same before God. Are Jews special? In some ways, they're special in the fact that they've been called out by God, chosen for them to be the line, the descendant in which Jesus would be born. Are they better than us? No. Are they better than any Gentile? No. In fact, they're held more accountable because they've been given more. Woo, just like you have. You are held accountable because you know. And you're held accountable to those that are around you. And he goes on and he says, Having cleansed their hearts by what? What's the word? Faith. Faith. That's an important word. I wrote it down here. Faith. Having cleansed their heart by faith. You see, it's really cool in what... Uh, what Peter is doing, he's given just a conclusion of things here and putting on how important it is that we understand. He has given, here's the essence of things. God chose, okay, God knows the heart. God gives the same spirit to every believer. He cleanses the heart by faith. And we are saved by the grace of the Lord. Look in verse 11. But we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they will. Okay, and that's where I put the word grace. You see, the, the point that, uh, that's important, why I put one up here and one down here, is this. This is God's part. This is man's part. Got it? God shows grace. And it's by his grace that you're saved. What's your part? Faith. Now, in between there is how we get saved. Now, we go to the second or the next part, and that's James' counsel. You see, the Bible has, has made it really simple for us. We follow what the Word has. And there's some things sometimes when we read the Bible, we, we get confused in, in under, not understanding that everything in the Bible doesn't mean we follow everything in the Bible. Ooh, be careful, Glenn, right? Ooh, whoop, 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 got to your attention. In other words, there's examples in the Bible. Do we follow every example in the Bible? And Judas went out and betrayed. That's not an example to follow. That's an example of warning. Saul, King Saul, went out and sought a witch for wisdom. That's an example. It's a bad example, right? See, there's examples, but they're recorded. They're truth. They're truth. See, the Bible, that doesn't cover, and, you know, it doesn't, you know, uh, make everything all rosy, and it just tells truth. There's examples. And, 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 and then there's other examples. There's examples of washing feet. Is it, is it something we're commanded to do? No, not really. He says when we have communion, it says we are to take this bread and take this, this wine, this juice. But he never said commanded us. He did set an example, though. 
Now, examples can be followed, and then some of them are good. And stuff. And he also said, you know, in conquering Jericho, march around it seven times. Does that mean we are to, yeah, every, every problem in life, we go in circles seven times or something? You no, know? no, not, not necessarily. It was something that he did at that time and recorded it. Uh, when, when the blind man, he came to the blind man. One blind man, he, you know, he, he mixes some mud, puts it on his eyes, and the man could see. Well, next time you find a blind person, you go make some mud and slap it on his face. See what happens. He'll slap you back. Okay. <laughs> that, you know, they're examples of the power of God and how God wanted to work. But you see, that's what's so unique. God, you can't put God in a box. And we try to put God in boxes. And he doesn't work that way. He works different all the time. And the Jews had tried to put God in a box. And he's saying, you know, well, you got, you got to fit in the box. You got to be circumcised and you got to do this and you got to eat the certain food and you can't have bacon anymore, all right? You know? And, 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 the, and Peter's saying, no, no, that's not the way it goes. And then there's things of historical records. It's just pure historical record. Doesn't mean we're to follow or anything. You know, Jesus raised the dead. So you're going to raise, you're supposed to raise the dead. No, Jesus raised the dead. Old Testament, we have a couple of examples. In the New Testament, we have just a few examples. You know, how about in Acts chapter 2? It says, in the church, and they sold, and the people, they sold everything they had, and they gave it to everybody and to the poor. All right, all in favor? Oh, you got quiet there. No, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, the poor little kid in the back said, yeah, I'm in favor of that. Everybody said, uh, I saw that hand, hand, Tommy. All right. Yeah, th does that mean because it's recorded that we're doing it? No, they did do that. They saw a need and they did. And the church got together and they sold their properties and everything. They're helping. They're in persecution. Does that mean then that we're going to sell our homes and give everything we have? And No, it doesn't. But if God leads you to. No, it wasn't a command. Okay. And so, so we have to sort some of those things out and see what is truth. And so we come to James' counsel. And James, it says in verse 13, and after, the, after they finished, oh, first verse 12, I'm sorry. And all the assembly fell silent and they, they listened to Barnabas and Paul as they related to what signs and wonders God had done through them uh, among the Gentiles. And after they finished speaking, James replied, brothers, listen to me. And he goes on, and the first thing he does is quote scripture. And he uses scripture to support the decisions that have been made. And first of all, in verse 16, after this, and he's quoting out of the book of Amos, chapter 9, verse 11 and 12. After this, I will return and I will rebuild the tent of David that has fallen, and I will rebuild its ruins and I will restore it, that the remnant of mankind may seek the Lord. And what? They had missed this. All the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who makes these sayings known from of old. Whoa. And the Jews have kind of missed that. You mean Gentiles would be called of God? Yes. So James stands up very wisely and says, Guys, I've got evidence in the scripture that what Peter has said is truthful. That yes, Gentiles are called of God. Praise God, everybody. Yeah, amen. We get the gospel too. That was an important thing. And so he uses scripture. And then he says, God accepts them by faith. And it says in verse 19, Therefore, my judgment is that we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God, but should write to them to abstain from things that polluted, uh, polluted by idols and from sexual immorality and from what has been strangled, from, uh, strangled and from blood. For from ancient generations, Moses has had at every city those who proclaim him, for he is read every Sabbath in the synagogues. Here's what James basically says. He uses scripture, and then he says, God accepts the believers, all believers, by faith. So should we. When God does something new, get over it. Now, that's my interpretation of saying what really it says. And so God changed things. And the church is growing and changed through the years. And we used to have big old organs and pipe organs, and that's the only way that could be worshipped. Well, we just don't have room for pipe organ here, Okay. And then, then it changed and they had pianos. Ooh, piano in the church? 
Do you realize that pianos were really an issue at one time? Woo! And then they went and did something, the craziest thing they ever did in churches. They put chairs and not pews. Oh, my, those liberal churches. I saw that in my day. Chairs, can you imagine? They move. They move. They're not fastened down. The solid rock of the pew. <laughs> I know you think that's silly, but that used to be a real issue. And then we go on to these newer issues that we have today. And it's also full issues that we lose. And so he gives some practical advice. And the practical advice is this. And he says, guys, what you do, you don't want to be offensive to others. And there's a few things that God said in Leviticus, he says, I think are still good. One is, abstain from anything that has to do with idols. Well, that's good, because Jesus says that. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, nothing else. Another thing that's very important is that, that it says that we're to stay away from sexual immorality. Yeah, Jesus commanded that too. Anything that's immoral. Sight, thought, whatever it is, or act. Stay away from that. And then it says, and whatever strangled or, or drinking of blood. Leviticus had some rules about that. Because God said, life is in the blood. Don't drink it. That's where, it's a very, very important thing. It's the most offensive thing you could do on Jew, to, before Jew is to do that. So just stay away from those things. And we'll all be a family and we'll work together just fine. The conclusion of, of this was this, is that out of chapter 15, and just in just a matter of just a minute, let me take this. There was, there was three solas that came in the Reformation. Martin Luther in 1517 and uh, October, what, 13? The 31st of, of that year in the doors of Wittenberg in Germany. He nailed the 95 Theses. And the source of those 95 Theses was what he established as three solas. Now solas is a Latin word for three alones or onlys. It's a hard word to, in, in, to get into English, but it's only or alones. And he's saying, here's the source and here's the foundation because he got so tired of how the church had gotten so mucked up with junk and how Christians had got so mucked up with all these other things. And he said, scriptural alone, sola scripture, grace alone, only grace, faith alone, only by faith. If I were to say to you this morning, here's your salvation, a gift, a box. Salvation to whosoever, okay? Salvation, eternal life. And, and salvation is something that inside that box is all these things. There's peace, there's purpose, there's victory over any sin, there's love when hatred is abounding in this world. There's love, overpowering love in this box of salvation. There's patience when you run out of it. Mm-hmm. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. Okay. Power when you are weak. Forgiveness when you know that you've done wrong and willing to forgive others is in this box. That's what salvation is. And it's from who? Jesus, who paid it all. You see, every present is to and from. And as the Bible says, it's a gift of God, right? And that's what salvation is. And so when I, I take this gift of salvation, you see, God's part is grace that he offers this box, this gift to you. Your part is faith to accept the gift. Nothing else is to be added. Nothing. In 1900, the theologians said, 
Martin Luther was good, but we'd like to add two more. <laughs> and that's the way it goes. But it really wasn't to change the three, but to expound on. And number four, number five, sola number four, Christ alone. And sola number five, sola de gloria. Sola de gloria. So in other words, only glory to God. And it, so the two things were, were very important is the saying, only Christ. And that's where the song that we sang this morning comes from. And we're going to close our service with it. Christ alone. And the band's going to come right now. We're going to sing this. And I'm going to ask you. I look over the crowd and I look at all of you. Is, is your faith in Christ alone? Is there anything else in your life that you're counting on to get you to that gift? Is there anything at all that you have, you have substituted? You say, well, I give a certain amount. I do a certain amount of water. No, is it Christ alone? When I say to you, how do you know that you're saved? How do you know that Jesus has given you eternal life? If your answer isn't Christ alone, there's something wrong with your Christianity. And you're following a false Christianity. Christ alone. He is our rock. He is our hope. He is everything. I can't add to that. There's nothing I've got. What are you going to put? How much is salvation worth? A thousand dollars? A hundred thousand dollars? A billion dollars? A, a trillion dollars? How much is it worth? What do you got to add to that? Anybody got a trillion dollars? <laughs> it's, it's priceless. It can't be bought because it's already been bought. Let's stand. Let's sing this song.